Hello everyone, in today's video uh, we're going to be continuing our discussion on intermediate navigation slash fuel planning uh, slash navigation. We're going to be taking a look at performance calculations. Now when it comes to performance, there's a lot of different calculations that you're going to need to do. And again, uh, the more you can do these and the quicker you can do these, the less frustration you're going to experience. In the real world, it really depends completely on kind of what you're doing for as far as what's going to actually be required of you. But in general, for those of you who are looking for a more advanced topic, especially after our previous video that was dealing with true speed, you're going to be getting a pretty good idea of this. All right, let's kick it off. So first things first, uh, the first kind of calculation we're going to be doing here is going to be calculating our takeoff distance. Now there's a lot of assumptions you have to make when you do a takeoff distance assumption. First of all, we're going to be assuming that the pilot knows how to take the plane off. I know that sounds kind of silly, but it's one of those things that people are like, well, why am I taking 60 more feet than the uh, test pilot who flies this thing every day does? Uh, surprise, because of the test pilot. The second thing we're going to have to take into account is stuff like our weight. You know, how heavy is our aircraft? Are we fully loaded? Or is the aircraft itself uh, designed in such a way that we can't fly it if we uh, put too many weight in the back? Maybe it throws off our center of gravity. These are all things you're going to have to be thinking about as far as your takeoff distances. Now, to make things a little bit more complicated, there are actually two different style of takeoff distance charts that you're probably going to encounter out there in the world. The first type you have is what I like to call kind of the, um, basically the chart style. This is what you get out of a 172. This is actually out of a 172 POH. The second style you're going to see is what they call a graph style. The graph style is significantly more accurate to use, but it takes longer to work with. The chart style on the flip side, it only takes a second to basically take a quick look and go, hey, I know exactly what I need to do with this airplane. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at both of these so that you can have a pretty good idea. So let's start with the easier of the two, and that's going to be the one dedicated to this particular style. Now, the way this works is basically what you're going to do is you're going to select the weight of the plane. This, by the way, came out of the performance chapter of a Cessna 172. So we have 2,100, we have 1,900, and we have 2,300 pounds here. Now, one thing you need to know is that you want to always round up. This is just a general rule. So if we have a plane that's 2,200 pounds, just use the 2,300 pound. So now the way this works is we're going to go ahead and take a look here. So we need to be using flaps up full power before we let go of the brakes we're assuming a level a dry runway and we're also assuming that there's no wind now this is interesting because they expect the pilot to be using short field technique a short field technique means hold the brakes full power let go of the brakes it also says, and this is interesting, in the event that you're flying more than 3,000 feet, you're expected to lean the mixture first. Again, this is pilot technique. This isn't anything to do with the performance chart. This also says decrease distances 10% for each nine knots of headwind. So if you have, let's say, a headwind of nine knots and your distance is 1,000, that would actually mean it's a 900-foot run-up. This is a drastic, drastic calculation. If you have a tailwind, increase distances by 10% for every two knots, which means if we have a 10 knot tailwind, our takeoff distance is increased by 50%. Now, the last thing they're gonna tell us here is for an operation on a dry grass runway, increase distances by 15% of the ground roll figure. Grass takes longer to take off from. All right, let's try this out. So let's assume our plane weighs 2,100 pounds. Okay, cool. We're gonna be lifting the nose up at 50 knots, and at 50 feet, we're expected to be 56 knots. This is a Cessna 172N, by the way, if you're curious but which particular one. Let's go ahead and grab myself a brush so I can do a little bit of doodling. That wasn't a brush. Sorry about that. Go away. All right, grab myself a pencil. Oh, that is the world's smallest pencil. All righty, so 2,100 pounds. We're looking at a 50 knot liftoff speed. We want to be 56 knots when we get off, like I said. So now what we're going to do is we're going to need to figure out what our pressure altitude is. Now, for those of you who uh, saw my video a couple of weeks ago or last week, you probably know the, how to calculate pressure altitude. Pressure altitude is basically the altitude the aircraft says it is when you dial in your altimeter to 29 or 9 or 2. Again, round up. So if we're in a situation where our pressure altitude is 550 feet, we just assume 1,000 feet. If it says 4,000 feet, don't forget to lean the mixture, all we just assume five, I'm sorry, say 4,000 feet. So now what we do is we're going to read the temperature off the top of our chart here. And again, always round up. So we have our 10 degrees Celsius. Let's assume it's 20 degrees outside today. So we're going to be reading from this column right here. Now let's also assume, of course, that um, let's pretend our, we're at a pressure altitude 2,000 feet, which is an unusual. All we would do now is we just read straight across, and that would give us our two critical numbers here. The first number here is called a ground roll number. This is how many feet it takes before the plane is going to leave the ground. The second number is called the 50-foot obstacle clearance number. This refers to how many feet it's going to take from start 
to actually get over a 50 foot obstacle. So if you have a runway, for example, excuse my awful doodle here, and you have an obstacle sitting here like this, and this is 50 feet, this is how much distance it's going to take you to be able to clear that 50 feet obstacle. So just like that kind of a thing. So it's really, really important that you consider that when you're setting up your individual pieces here. Let's go ahead and uh, do another example. This time I'll have you work it out. All right. So we have a plane that weighs 2,263 pounds. It's 11 degrees Celsius, because we don't use Fahrenheit. And the pressure altitude is 850 feet. All right, if you want to go ahead and pause the video and uh, try it out yourself, go for it. All right, let's go ahead and try it out and see if we can figure it out. By the way, I'm providing you a link down below if in case you want to try these things out for the actual Cessna as well. Keep in mind, you need the POH for the plane you're flying. So uh, one thing I actually have my students do is they'll actually make a POH, actually they'll make a performance table based on what they actually do in the simulator. They're great things to have and people will kill for them, especially for the airliner folks. Okay, let's try this out. So the first things first is we know our plane weighs 2,263 pounds. So that means we're going to be using the uh, 2,300 pound chart. Again, the reason we're using this is because we always want to round up. Second thing is, we know it's 11 degrees Celsius outside. All right, since we're 11 degrees, we're going to be using the 20 degrees chart. Yes, you can definitely interpolate between these two. It's called lerping in case you're looking for the magical word. Uh, generally, whenever you're guessing, uh, you're, you're putting yourself in danger, no matter how accurate your math is. So I'm actually going to be using this column. So again, we're going to be using the 2300. We're going to be using the 20 degrees Celsius for our column here. And now we're going to go ahead and find what our pressure altitude was. In this case, our pressure altitude is 850 feet. So while we're going to round up to 1,000, which is going to bring us right here. It's going to take us 915 feet to get off the ground, and it's going to take 1,630 feet to actually get the aircraft airborne. Now, if you were to do this exact same flight, but you were to do a uh, grass takeoff on this, what you would do is you take 15% of that and you'd add it in. So 915 times 15, 137 plus 915, it would actually take us 1,052 feet to get off the ground. Now, the great thing here is, yes, that's an extra um, 15 feet, basically, or 337 feet, rather, but we'd have to add that directly to our total to clear 50-foot obstacle also. So 1630 plus 137 would mean we need almost 17 1,500 feet in order to safely clear a 50-foot obstacle after taking off. So again, you can see how dangerous these calculations get. When you do these calculations with airliners, again, we're going to have to wait until uh, FSS, or I should say MSFS, gets themselves like a really, really nasty heavy-duty airliner. We can take a look at what those charts look like because they're a little different. What you actually do is you take off standard altitude, or standard distance, and you actually subtract or modify the factors. It's a little different, but it's the same idea. Okay, so let's say, of course, uh, we'll take our same scenario now, and let's say we're at 915 uh, plus, uh, what do we say, 1,052 feet? Let's say we also have a headwind, and we'll say we have a 9-knot headwind. That means we decrease distances by 10%. So we'll go ahead and multiply that by 1, 0. So then we can go ahead and say 105.2 minus 105.2. And you can see, because of the headwind, we've actually gotten very, very close to our original takeoff figure. Now, these charts are pretty handy, but they're not terribly accurate, which is why they have a separate kind of chart that you're going to see more commonly in especially general aviation planes when you're working off takeoff distance. And that's going to look a little like this. Now, when you first take a glance at this, uh, most people go, oh boy, that, that's a lot more nasty than what we had a minute ago. It's actually not bad at all. They're very easy to use. Basically, what you do is you set your outside air temperature down here. Then you drag a line up to what your pressure altitude is bring your pressure altitude across and then down, put on your takeoff mass, put on your wind component, and then read off on the side here. So let's go ahead and uh, see if we can work that out real quick. All right, so let's assume, for example, that we're 20 degrees Celsius. So what I would do is I come down to my 20 degrees Celsius line and I go ahead and draw myself a handy dandy vertical line. So now this vertical line is uh, way too small for you to see. <laughs> Let me go ahead and clean that up a little bit, make it a little bit easier for you. Grab my handy dandy line tool. Come from 20 Celsius straight up. Oh, yeah, that's a honking line. Boop. And unfortunately, I made it the color white. Ah, I just can't win sometimes. You know how it goes. All right, grab this. Give me that red. Ah, now you can see it. Cool. So now what you're going to do is you're going to find where this line for your temperature intersects your pressure altitude. So let's assume for a second that, uh, not assume, that would be for bodies, that our pressure altitude is 2,000 feet. So what we do now is we come where this intersection is and go ahead and draw ourselves a new line all the way to where our mass is. You can see now I've got kind of intersect them gone straight across. Now what we're going to do is dial in the mass. This, by the way, is for a Diamond 40 aircraft, which is one of the default aircraft that you can get your hands on inside a flight simulator. This is why you got to know how to read the math. 
So now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and set the takeoff mass. Let's assume my mass today is a 1,900 pounds, which is pretty darn light. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my line. Whoops, I didn't accidentally mean to try to change this into Spanish. I mean, I believe my nuance, my nose, but um, that's not exactly my uh, specialty there. All right, go straight down. And now I've got my mass line. So what we do now is we follow this little slope line to our next line. So I'm going to click right here, follow this down hill until we intersect this new point. So you can see that I've modified my pressure altitude for my mass. So now this is the fun part. We're going to go ahead and take a line from that perspective straight horizontally. Again, you can use Microsoft Paint for this. And now what we're going to do is we're going to modify it for whatever the wind is for that day. Let's assume for a second the uh, wind is uh, 10 knots here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that straight up. And now we do the same technique. We follow the slope of the nearest line, come to that point, and then make our way straight across to the edge. And then we read off our ground roll distance. In this case, we can see our ground roll distance is going to be about 310 meters or so. I'm just kind of like studying real quick. Let's go ahead and pull that line all the way across so we can see it in feet. That's going to give us a takeoff ground roll of 1,000. We'll go ahead and apply that transformation, 1,050 feet. So you can see that is a heck of a lot more accurate than what we were doing on the previous page. And again, you can write algorithms and things like that using a computer to actually calculate these things dynamically for you. Now you're sitting there going, uh, what about if it's grassy? Well, if it's grassy, remember it's the same philosophy. You're simply going to take whatever your takeoff distance is and go ahead and add in that 15% increased distance. Now note, this is takeoff ground roll. This is not necessarily takeoff over 50 feet. Over 50 feet, you usually add about half of the distance. In this case, we'd probably probably get airborne at about a thousand feet and we'd probably be over a 50 foot obstacle at about 1500 feet. So with these two pieces of evidence and these uh, two different techniques, you can very accurately determine our takeoff distance for our ground roll. Now this doesn't have anything to do as far as the fuel planning. Uh, usually your book will tell you how much fuel it takes to take the plane off. Our next piece we're going to have to look at is going to be how long it takes us to get up to altitude, how fast we get up to altitude, and how much fuel we used when we get up to altitude. Enjoy.